Okay, we are back to We're Teaching back. Music Tomorrow. Uh, my name is Victoria Bowler. I'm here with the fabulous, bright-eyed, and bushy-tailed Anne Molesky. <laughs> is very early over there. <laughs> Anne, it's been um, a little bit since we've done this. How are you feeling? It's, it's been a minute. I'm good. I feel like, because we recorded, I was thinking about this this morning as I was getting out of bed. I was like, um, well, we recorded this summer, but I feel like I lived another life <laughs> after you recorded last mm -hmm. there's been a lot that's been going on you too right yeah yeah for yeah. sure well why don't you talk about what's new in your world yeah so um i went and did some kodai teaching this summer um and then came back and lived the rest of the summer with kids and family and travel and all that stuff and it was lovely um this fall i am back at doing some work with undergraduates so um, I'm not teaching elementary methods this year. That class is only offered like every other semester, but I'm doing lots of student teacher supervision in the field and helping folks lesson plan and get their elementary music experience. So that's kind of what music teaching or teaching music tomorrow looks like for me right now. What about mm -hmm. you? Do you want to start with that stuff? Well, do you want to talk oh. about going to school? <laughs> yeah. So if not, I'll um, cut it out. No, it's fine. So then the other big thing that's going on is starting some doctoral coursework. So um, picking things back up from where I left off post kids, um, not at the same institution. So um, I was able to use some of my good stuff from Indiana University towards um, another program. And so I'm back in the thick of the research world and diving feet first head first whatever the say it is i haven't had enough coffee yet but um in in all of that so that's pretty exciting stuff yeah and yeah. you you just started that like like just last like week. literally literally classes started yesterday okay <laughs> so <laughs> like i'm going to be done talking to you and send out some emails to student teachers and then i'm gonna hit the ground running with some work that i need to get done so yeah mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you and I are in a similar boat. Um, we both get to jump into doctoral coursework. You are getting a DMA and I, and I am doing an EDD. So an EDD. Um, so we have like some, some differences of perspectives that hopefully, you know, I, and I was telling you, like, I consider myself to be getting a DMA because whatever you <laughs> do in your coursework, I'm going to be like, tell me, and what was the reading and what did you think about it? And then, so I'll have an honorary DMA, whether they know it or not. So <laughs> I don't Everybody know how ethical, yeah, I don't know how um, ethical that is. Um, my EDD is in curriculum and instruction, and then I have a concentration of music. So a couple different layers there. So I went like the gin ed route mm -hmm. and Anne, you are going further into the the music route. So I think that yeah. combining together, I, I really do think it's it's a nice um, pairing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Especially since we collaborate so much and talk so much about what we're thinking about and reading and doing and sharing with practicing teachers and kids that we might be teaching and all mm -hmm. of that kind of stuff. So, so yeah, no, my uh, program is a DMA in music education. So, um, and a lot of that is because, first of all, like the degree that I started at IU was a PhD in mm -hmm. music education. So a lot of that coursework was able to kind of go toward what I'm doing now. Um, and then also um, I don't have an undergraduate in music education. I only have a master's, right? So, um, and a certification, right? So I feel like more music education specific, like curriculum, big, broad spectrum, education stuff is good for me too, in terms of music education specifically. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. so I can be more, just do more good stuff. Yeah, I completely, I completely agree. I think it's, um, I think it's a really, really good thing for you to have for all of the work that you do. And then when I think about mm. my full-time work of writing curriculum, I think it's, mm. it's natural. So anyway, we can move, we can move off of that. Um, the other, uh, life update from me is that in addition to doing my full-time curriculum work, and then in addition to doctoral work for my EDD, I'm also teaching K-5 elementary general music. So we have, um, a lot of different viewpoints and a lot of different hats that, that we get to kind of explore together here but it all starts with Anne. it all starts with <laughs> singing a song and playing a game oh my gosh and this is one of i was talking to my sister when she was teaching elementary music she came from the band world and i think i've talked about her before um mm -hmm. but just like how do you get them to learn a song if they don't read music like how do you teach it to them if they can't 
read it if it's not in front of their face and then it's like well do you do the song first and then the game but they can't really do the game until they learn the song or like should we teach them the notation first so they can read the song like how do you and then they're singing it inaccurately and then it's it's wrong and and I'm frustrated and like they won't listen blah 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 blah, blah. like it can go off the rails um deceptively quickly <laughs> Right. No, that's true. And, you know, I think it's it's interesting you mentioned, like, your sister coming from the band world. I When I was teaching this summer, one of the first things I do in Code I Level 1 in most programs, if not all, would do this too, is just teaching a song by rote, right? And um, just because we're talking about a singing, a predominantly singing classroom, and so we want to get started off on, on the right foot. And I had a lot of graduate students who were coming in who had never taught or who were teaching elementary, but like were also teaching middle school. And so like mm -hmm. elementary was kind of, this sounds bad, but maybe secondary in their mind, right? Sure, or they just sure. were kind of, they just weren't sure what to do because we're well, also so used different. to like playing in an ensemble, right? We're all used to playing in an ensemble. We feel like, um, you know, everybody I feel like has like a good level of confidence, a healthy level of confidence with that. Whereas mm -hmm. if you have kids sitting in front of you with no instruments and they're supposed to make music, it's really difficult to figure out what that starting point can be. Right. Yeah. And even for those of us who only teach elementary or are exclusive early or elementary um, music teachers, um, depending on the models that you were given and the resources you were giving, teaching a song can look like, well, I'm going to sing and the kids are just going to sing along with me. Right. Or I'm just going to do the thing and then they'll catch up when they can. Where that that can be a really difficult approach because as we've talked about before in our classroom the songs are the curriculum right the music the repertoire that we're using is the actual stuff that we're doing um to pull out like curricular concepts like in terms of musical elements for literacy and fluency and all that good stuff so the thing is is that Yes, students can learn, and I'm sure we'll talk about this either this episode or next episode. Students absolutely can learn a song or learn the material as you're doing the activity, but there might be a more, um, a be the coffee has not kicked in, <laughs> a, better, I'm with you. a better way, a better way or a more efficient way or a more accurate way, or I'm not getting the right word right now, mm -hmm. but something that sets everybody up for success right at the onset. Yeah. So this, this phrase, like you just start singing and they'll catch on when they catch on, like they just jump in when, when they feel like they can. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because I don't think that that is like a detrimental strategy. I don't think that it's mm -hmm. impossible no. to teach kids that way. Right. Cause like, how do they no. learn it on the radio? They listen mm -hmm. and then they kind of chant along. And then after a while, it just becomes more refined and more refined and more refined. So if we want to think of like an immersive experience where I just sing it and it gets in your ears and then you just join in, that's a very organic way to learn how to sing a song, right? So I don't think that it's, um, I don't think that's, it, it's an incorrect approach. I think no, if your no. goal though, and this is what you were saying, if your goal is a specific curricular objective, like I want students to pull this skill, or I want to pull this aural awareness, or I want them to notice the form, then we have some really beautiful opportunities right at the beginning as we are teaching this song, right? For students to start engaging in what we could consider to be like some kind of higher order thinking skills, you know? Mm -hmm. um, like what's, what's the highest word? And we start analyzing it. We start like piecing together and like making a map in our brains. And I have a feeling that you might be doing something like that in how you teach your song. Yeah, and the thing is, so, so all of that is making me think about how my experience this summer, every time I teach this <laughs> Kodai pedagogy classes is, is different. This is the third time I've taught level one. It's the third time I've done like a rote song assignment and it's been different every single time for a, different programs, using other people's materials to make sure it's cohesive in the program, all that kind of stuff. This was the first time since it was a new program where I kind of had full reign on what it looked like. And I had to go back and like change it. <laughs> and I'm just gonna be honest and own up to my mistakes. And all my graduate students knew that too, because I came in um, inside of American methodology and we can link that text. I think we have before. Um, there's like a great two pager on all the different strategies that you yes. can use to teach a song. Um, and I've kind of adapted that with some other resources. There's a, I have a couple, I think a couple podcast episodes or a blog post or something that we can link to um, about that, mm -hmm. um, about just the different strategies. And so I started out with that, keeping in mind that a lot of these folks are either newly going to be teaching elementary or we're kind of in that middle school boat where they like weren't really sure what to do with the kids without instruments in front of them, right? Um, and as they, sorry, I'm getting tangential, but anyway, good, as good. they as they came in and <laughs> had to teach a song by row, and I'm not laughing because everybody did, 
exactly. It was one of those moments that I often have with my kids where I'm like, you did exactly what I told you to. And that was not at all what I wanted to happen. <laughs> right. But you followed yeah, the like, assignment. How dare you do what tea. I said instead of what I wanted? Yes, I know. Yeah, but it was like we were using lots of different strategies and there was just a lot of teacher talk and a lot of stuff that wasn't about singing the song and playing the game. And so I backtracked big time and I was like, you guys did great. Like, these were awesome strategies. These were great. <laughs> like, you you nailed it. Like, you could pick any, like, take a segment of this and any of your kids would do a great job. However, we need to make sure that most of what's happening in this lesson segment, in this part of your lesson where you're teaching the song that the kids are singing a lot and they're hearing it a lot because if we're doing like a lot of teacher talk or a lot of explaining or so much questioning without hearings in front of it that students don't really aren't really sure what's what the song was or only heard it once and then they're being asked to sing like those are great strategies but we have to make sure the singing piece is there um so yeah so that that's just something just something to think about so what i ended up doing was going back and having them kind of line it out which mm -hmm. as we know is like kind of the most painful or maybe the most unmusical or un most uninteresting way to do it but i think just i would call it like tried and true and right okay but you know true. but it can work beautifully in conjunction with some of these other strategies right depending on the song which we're about to get into in just a yes. little bit but the thing is is that like going my turn your turn with like for my four beats your four beats then we go back and we make it longer like that kind of rote style teaching is really really effective because it's built-in scaffolding they hear the whole song we go back we go like motive by motive phrase by phrase like whatever you want to say mm -hmm. and then the students have the opportunity to hear the song and combined with some other strategies like oh um what was falling from the tree listen this time and let me know what you think apple mm -hmm. tree right like that kind of thing um then i think there can be it can be much more effective than simply being like listen to my song and answer all of these questions okay listen to my song and then it's going to be your turn to actively be making music mm -hmm. okay i just talked to you a lot so i'm gonna take a drink of water and let you respond <laughs> no you're good you're good so are you saying because you and i both use the like i sing and ask questions and are you saying like when it comes to practical strategies that um i sing the song and then i ask you a question and now you have something to listen for and then I sing the song again, and then you answer mm -hmm. the question. I give you a new thing to listen for, and then I sing the song again, and then you answer, then I give you something else to listen for. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, the question always comes before the listening, mm -hmm. right? Because if you say, if you say, oh, what was my song about? And then they weren't listening for that because their brains are going a million miles a minute, and they were like, oh, apples, I wonder if they're red or green or if they're rotten or there's a worm in it or, or whatever else it might be, right? I don't even know because I wasn't – I tuned you out because it's just another teacher like <laughs> – I didn't have something to do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, the last thing I want to say before we jump in, I agree with 100% everything you say, and I will add to it that we actually have a decent amount of research on mm. um, singing songs and pitch accuracy when you're learning a song by rote. And the question of like how much echoing phrase by phrase versus immersive just like mm -hmm. listen to it and join in like which one of those leads to a better result and we actually do have not that it's going to be the same in like every situation but we actually do have some information on which of those approaches is best and actually if you just do echo me the whole way through and kids don't get a chance to link it orally in terms of like the meter and the tonal context mm -hmm. and the weight of the phrase and how phrases go together and like pick up notes and everything like that if you just do echo me the result is not as great as when you put it in an immersive context and if you just mm. do an immersive context that's when we get um what i know we're all familiar with which like kids kind of chanting along and getting the rhyming words at the end of the phrase but they're not like they're not singing it they're chanting with it which is beautiful because they're engaged and they want to be engaged right but an approach of um you know and and every like MLT person is going like, oh yeah, oh yeah. But something like a whole part whole is a very mm. effective thing because you get the context, right? And then you can start doing something like asking specific questions and then you get into your echo singing and then you put it all back together. And that leads to a much more um, tuneful and accurate and more memorized uh, result. 
Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole too much because I've done a lot of, um, I've done a little bit of digging and research and writing about text and melody and all that kind of stuff. But just to say that like the text is the song to a lot of kids. Right. And so I, as you were saying like, oh, they're just chanting along. I think it, there is some benefit if kids are fresh or are getting hung up on a phrase or a part of a song that might be tricky. Like we do have some of those, right? Mm-hmm. That are like faster rhythms or, mm-hmm. or tricky rhythms or whatever. And we wanna make sure that they learn it correctly. I personally don't think, and I know this is not you, were, you weren't negating this. I personally think it's fine to take a minute and just speak the text and yes. then go back and sing the melody. Because if they're fumbling over some words that they're unfamiliar with, even if you've done some questioning, um, and we, we can make this concrete for everybody in a minute, but um, even if you've done some questioning or you've kind of like pointed, you know, done the your, my turn, your turn stuff, um, there's still those moments where some things are going to feel tricky to kids. And so I think just isolating the rhythm of the words, the way the words go, and then putting it back into that context for kids can be really effective when needed. Um, but I agree with what you're saying. I think that um, this whole part, whole thing is really important. And so if we think about kind of like a hybrid approach where it's not just like, all right, here's a new song, my turn, your turn, here we go. Um, but something where we like tell a story or we bring out a puppet or we like kind of pantomime the game as we're singing the song three-ish times yep. and asking questions in between. And then it's like, okay, let's see if you guys can sing this now. And then my turn, your turn and mm-hmm. being like apple tree, apple tree and like keep it moving mm-hmm. versus yes. versus having like, oh, that was great. Let's try that again. No, 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 no. Like be very deliberate about how we're going to break things down so that it feels like we have some musical momentum going in even that breaking down echo experience. I think that's really essential too. So you're saying, um, think about your process ahead of time, keep the momentum going, learn it correctly the first time. So you don't have to keep Mm. reteaching it over and over and over. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we talked about whole part whole. So we're thinking like Mm -hmm. musical context, and then we get into the weeds and then we're putting it together back in a, in a musical context. And I also heard you say, Anne, that there's going to be like a combination of approaches, right? So it's not just echo sing. It's not just listen to these questions. It's going to be like what you said, like you bring out your puppet, you start pantomiming the game, stuff like that. So you have like a bag of tricks that you can kind of piece Mm -hmm. together for, for a musical experience that Anne is about to share with us. Oh, sure. I'll go first. So it's interesting though. I just want to make a caveat (laughs) because the song that I'm about to share with you The lining, quote quote unquote, lining out, I don't like saying that, Um, the lining out or the um, my turn, your turn thing, where we start with like the first four beats, followed by the second four beats, followed by the third, followed by the fourth, then one and two, then three and four, works really well for most all songs. Um, But there might be some exceptions, right? If we're doing like a call and response or we have some repeated text, like what I'm about to share with you, it might look a little bit different. So I would say if you are listening to this and you're like, okay, great, I'm going to teach a song particularly to like K1. I feel like a lot of those, um, you know, 16 beat folk songs kind of fall into that category. I think this idea of like having this immersive experience where you're doing some questioning or like kind of turning it into magical musical land where you're just like telling a story and singing and then doing my turn, your turn, and then going back to kind of that magical experience works really well but i think particularly as we get into the older grades and we have um some more complex repertoire for lack of a better term Mm -hmm. and there might be some different ways that we're doing doing it yes yes am i I foreshadowing what you're about to share today too (laughs) you are making me question what i brought today but maybe we can Uh do another episode well maybe you can do another episode on this because like everything that you're saying is sparking like other things that I do with other songs. And um, yeah, there's, there's a lot here. Like there's, there's a lot of artistry uh, op- opportunities in how you teach a song. And what you're talking about is you've, you're opening a lot of doors to, to possibilities. Mm-hmm. Well, we can do two. We can do, I mean, we can share. I mean, I don't have all day. I have time. Anyway, okay, so let's roll. Um, so I, this is a song that I use for third grade usually. Um, and here's how it goes. Just listen. La 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 chickalileo, la 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 chickalileo, I'm gonna marry who I please, la 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 chickalileo. Oh, it's really fun to sing in the morning when you haven't warm up or had any water to drink. Okay, listen to my song one more time. And this song has some funny words. 
they might not sound like real words to you. They might sound like made up words. They might sound just kind of different. So listen one more time and let me know what those words are. Here I go. La 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 chickalileo, la 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 chickalileo. I'm gonna marry who I please. La 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 chickalileo. Victoria, did you hear any words that sounded kind of strange? Yes, I heard la, and I heard chicka, and I heard lileo. Yeah, so can you say la 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 chickalileo? La 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 chicka lily yo. Yeah, and every time you hear that, I want you to put your finger on your nose. Here we go. La 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 chicka lily yo. La 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 chicka lily yo. I'm gonna marry who I please. La 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 chicka lily yo. Yes, and Victoria is such a good student where she um, actually changed her direction and changed which hand was touching her nose by the uh, motive because she's such a good student. Yeah, cool. So I wonder how many times that happens. Listen one more time and tell me, count with your fingers, how many times those those words happen. Here I go. La 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 chicka lily yo. La 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 chicka lily yo. I'm gonna marry who I please. La la la. Yeah, awesome. So how many times, Victoria? I saw with your finger talk. Very good. Three. She's just showing me her three fingers. Wonderful. And everybody in the whole class could do that. Great. Now, there's some real words in there, too. Okay, so let's listen to those real words. Okay, and you can tell me what they are. Here I go. La, 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 chicka, lily, oh. La, 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 chicka, lily, oh. I'm gonna marry who I please. La, 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 chicka, lily, oh. What were the quote unquote real words that you heard, Victoria? I'm gonna marry who I please. And that is oh, Nathan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be so happy to hear that. <laughs> If he listens to this podcast, I'll hi, Nathan. Send it shout to out, him. shout out, great. Nathan. We can shout out Adam too if he's that's great. <laughs> it's fine. Anyway, okay, cool. So, um, I'm gonna marry who I please. So, you told me that we have three la la logical ileos, and then we also have an I'm gonna marry who I please. So, can you just follow along with me? Here I go, la la logical ileo, la la logical ileo. I'm gonna marry who I please, la 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 chicka lileo. And this time I want, I'm gonna marry who I please to be your job. Okay, can you sing that with me? Here, we, my turn first. I'm gonna marry who I please. I'm gonna marry who I please. Yeah, so that's your job when I get to you. Here I go, la 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 chicka lileo, la 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 chicka lileo. I'm gonna marry who I please. La 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 chicka Leo. And at this point, so this is a case where like the my turn, your turn, they have it. So let's try the whole song together. Ready, set, and here we go, etc. Right? So that's one that can happen um pretty organically because there's so much repeated text. There is a tricky part. Sometimes when I teach this, it's always, you know, it's one of those things, it's always different when you teach it. Um, it's one of those things, sometimes I'll just show the motives on my hands and I'll say, oh, there's three of those, which ones do you wanna be in charge of? Oh, the first one? Okay, great, your turn. Ready, set, and here you go, and they go. Right, because they've heard it so many times, the rhythm's the same. The second motive is a little bit different melodically, um, but overall, right, it's um, pretty repetitive. So it's something that they could get pretty quickly like that. And I really added it, it. And this is one of those cases too, where I went through every single little step. And for us as adults, it feels really painful. So there's two points there. Number one, for kids, it's not right. Number two, if it feels like they're getting it a little bit quicker, and I'm hesitant to say this, I think it's okay to skip a step. But I think it's important to scaffold things down to mm -hmm. the smallest step and think about like the simplest next question you could ask, even if they don't need it. Because this is one of those songs too that you start teaching and they just start singing along, right? To the point that we were making earlier. Yeah. Um, but if they just start singing along without thinking about the structure of the song, then they'll just be like, la, 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 chicka, la, like the whole time. And then we'll miss some of the, the, um, the intricacies of the song. So mm -hmm. yeah, super. I kept it real dry this morning, so. <laughs> and I think that's great because this is like the the structure. This is the recipe structure. And then you get to throw in, and I know like when you teach, I know like you would be throwing in facial expressions and you would be like, mm -hmm. I would say something, you'd be like, ooh, interesting. Let's double check, right? Or or whatever, mm -hmm. like you, you spice it up in the moment. But if you don't have the bones, and you and I talk about this all the time, like if you don't have the actual bones of the scaffold, then you're making the facial expressions, you're putting on 
on like the Anne show, but but the musical product isn't there because because the steps weren't exactly out and you didn't know how to not not you personally but like if you don't know how to step back and how to speed it up with these questions um the the musical result isn't as great as kids are capable of and we want kids to do the the musical um, skill level that they're capable of yes and to that point so that's what it would look like if i was teaching like it's my first year on a campus i have third grade i don't know what their musical experience is it's hard it, they're not used to singing you know, they need a lot of hand holding mm -hmm. versus third graders I've had since kindergarten. Maybe I'm like, hey, be my echo. Ba, 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 da, da, ba, ba. And they do that and yes. they kind of go ba, 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 da, da, ba, ba. the whole time I'm singing and they find the places where it's the same or it's different, right? Yes. And so that's a different strategy because those mm -hmm. kids would have a completely different skill set because there's a lot of retention at my school. I've seen them for three years already. I know exactly where they are. We've done a couple mm -hmm. of songs ahead of time um, mm -hmm. that are kind of leading up to this in my lesson or in previous lessons and so depending on where your kids are is going to impact a lot of how you're teaching this on right and if you are sitting there and kids are like rolling on the floor and they're over it with you asking them questions, then Anne, what you just gave us is a beautiful scaffold, right? Because that's communication from the kids. They're saying like, I'm ready for something else. And what you just said is if they're clapping that rhythm with us, that gives them something to do physically with their bodies. Mm -hmm. And then you can keep all of the questions, keep the whole process there, but you've given us something to do, you know? Yeah. And it doesn't have to be that. I mean, so if it's like the beginning kids, it can be la, la, la. La la la, whisper. La la la, la la la. Put it in your brain. Ba, ba, ba. And then I start singing the song, right? So yes. You can, keep, you can again bring it down to simpler parts. What? what? <laughs> go ahead. Smiling. You go ahead and teach you're, my thing. You teach my thing, like It's just your show now, and you go ahead. I was just, I was just about to say you're smiling like you love me, but that was the opposite. <laughs> I do love you, Anne. I'm so glad. Okay. I'm so Scene. glad you're here. <laughs> Scene. Go ahead. You're up. Okay. Well, that's, that's a beautiful. That's actually a beautiful pass off. Okay. So okay. I, um, I'm at a new campus this year, and so all the songs that I'm teaching, I'm teaching from scratch, and mm. all of the strategies that I'm using, I'm teaching the strategies from scratch. Right. Um, right. These kids had a very strong singing culture before I got to this school, which makes it nice, especially in upper elementary. So um, now that said, first day of school, um, I want to be just uh, I want to I want to have some options for how much singing I ask upper elementary to do in the first weeks. Definitely we're going to sing, um, but probably not like a big choral situation. Right. I probably want to have some other avenues for musicking, um, especially with upper elementary, especially early in the year. So in my back pocket, I have a couple options. One of them is we start off with some body percussion and I have, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, I have four steady beats in my pattern and this will be a familiar activity. This is like my bread and butter. And now I'm going to ask you find a different way for four steady beats to repeat over and over and over. And your options are snap, clap, pat, stamp. I don't want kids hitting their head. I don't want them like making a silly face as a body percussion thing. Exactly. Exactly. Doing the <laughs> right. And doing their um, flossing, doing the gritty, like whatever, <laughs> whatever it is. No. <laughs> so I give them their options and you've had enough coffee by this point and you're, you're a smart cookie. So um, I'm doing my body percussion. You have your body percussion. It's four steady beats and it repeats. Go ahead. Good, good, good. I'll pause you right there. Because what might happen is kids give me a rhythm and depending on what I care about that day, I might say mm. double check, right? And that's good assessment stuff for me. Um, double check, is my are my uh, sounds all the same distance apart? Like if you close your eyes and listen to the sound, are they the same distance apart or do you hear a combination of long and short sounds? And the answer is they're all the same distance apart. Even though the motions are different, if we close our eyes, they're all the same distance apart. Okay, so now you have your own steady beat pattern. I'm gonna ask you to do it four times in a row. One, two, ready, go, one, and you did a great job. Thank you, that was excellent. Now, will you please, and this is a new signal, whoosh, turn to a partner, and you and your partner together will find a way to combine your steady beat stuff. Okay, so now you do it. We do it four times in a row, you and your partner, excellent. Now, we're gonna sit down, and you have your body percussion thing to do while I am speaking a new rhyme. Uh, you're gonna do it how many times in a row? Four. Beautiful, one. Two, here you go. 
Hey, hey, it's your lucky day because we're here and we're fourth grade. Clap your hands and say hello because we are people you should know. Okay, so you have your body percussion thing. You know to do it four times. You did it on your own. Then you combined with a partner. Now we're putting it with the rhyme. And this is where we enter the question part of the, of the experience. But students have something else to do. What I did not do at my school and what I plan on doing, but this was not the, the appropriate context. But what I want to move toward is I have a list of questions on the board. And it's just pick your favorite question to answer. So how many phrases um, could any of this work with an ostinato? Would this work in a round? Um, what, oh, I don't know, like what kind of bordoon would work? What's the highest sound? What's the lowest sound? How many times do you hear the word blank? So you can, you have different questions on the board and students just pick which one they want to answer with their partner. Okay, so it's the exact same thing. Um, the first day of school was not the time to introduce that on top of everything else, but that's something that I want to move toward uh, with upper elementary specifically. Okay, so now we've done this a million times and I've been asking you questions and I've told you to change your body percussion thing and do something different. And we were asking questions like the exact same process that you did, Anne. Now I'm gonna say with your partner, decide which part of the rhyme you're going to speak. Choose one phrase. Let me stop. What's a phrase? And students have their own definition. It's not like harmonic motion marked by a cadence. It's like they'll, they'll say it's like a sentence. And I say, great. Yes, that's perfect. Just like one little part. So students with their partner are going to choose which part of the rhyme they will speak. And so then I say, practice in your head. Here we go. Hey, hey, it's your lucky day because we are here. We're fourth grade. Clap your hands and say hello because we are people you should know. And if they've got it and they're ready to say their part, they give me a thumbs up. Then I'm going to speak it with them as they're doing their body percussion. I speak it with them and then I'm going to say, okay, it's all you. And they speak it together. So you have like a popcorn thing going on throughout the whole class where like I'm only saying this phrase that I chose because it was in my ear already, right? And then eventually like the next step is just everybody says the whole thing. So this is the exact same um, process that you did, but it's approached from a different angle, but it's the exact same thing. It's like, it's still um, a bunch of my turn, your turn, whether that ends up being students speak it by themselves or they're echoing the teacher. It turns into like my turn, your turn, but divided amongst the ensemble. It's still them just saying one specific part and they were singing one specific part in your thing. Um, you had us scaffold to uh, some sort of body percussion thing or some extra job that students do. Uh, so it's a lot of the same strategies, but in a different context. All right. So I love that. I think that what's nice about it, you were talking about how there's a lot of like my turn, your turn, teacher interaction students like but what's beautiful about that is particularly since it's fourth grade is there's so much opportunity for student choice mm -hmm. right um so like even though you're asking them to respond and like take part and kind of learn all on with you it's and like mine was much more maybe prescribed right because i it was very teacher directed you're giving a lot more choice and options for the students because they're in that bigger ensemble and other people are picking up the pieces and because you've already added that layer right because they're their students who have had lots of experience so they're ready for that type of um that type of independent musicianship in a way that younger students or students that um, maybe hadn't had such a rich um, ensemble experience beforehand wouldn't have done right mm -hmm. and the other yeah. thing i want to add to that is you had a song and mm -hmm. i had a rhyme and mm -hmm. the purpose of my rhyme is it turns into a name game so yeah yeah so it doesn't really the the curricular objective is like steady beat and we have an ensemble experience your song chicolilio has much more intricacies mm -hmm. right and you're going to be pulling things out that i'm not pulling out of this so again it's context dependent yeah right yeah and so and that comes back to something that i wrote down you said you know when you ask students to do their ostinato pattern um depending on what you care about if they're doing like a rhythm or they're doing a steady beat um you know you kind of let that go or you or or not um and so 
I don't want to put words in your mouth, but for me, <clears throat> even if I'm adding in an ostinato, like, yes, ideally I'd like it to be accurate. But if I'm looking at a lesson segment where my goal is for the students to learn the song, mm -hmm. as long as they're singing the song correctly or saying the chant correctly, I don't really care about the other job, which is kind of like one of those ancillary, not ancillary, but like um, additional strategies you can put in. Um, as long as like they're doing their job, but they're singing the song correctly, that's all I care about, right? Like my curricular objective for this lesson segment is for them to be singing la 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 chikalilio accurately so that we can mm -hmm. use it again later to extract that element so do i care if they're going la 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 and then instead of la la la, la, la. no i don't yes because they're engaged and that was the purpose of having them keep that asanati right yes yes however flip it mm -hmm. if your point were la 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 chikalilio tt T ta, what do you say? T T T ticka T T ta. Yeah. <clears throat> if that were your purpose and someone went la 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 chicka la li yo, you would probably mm -hmm. care that the ostinato was accurate if the purpose was pulling the rhythm from that specific phrase, right? Like if the ostinato were yeah. to serve a rhythmic function, that is what you would care about. If you just want them to sing the song accurately, that's a different thing, right? So like knowing knowing your your purpose there. Yeah, and in the moment, so like say that I had planned for them to all go la 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 chicka la li yo, but I noticed there's not accuracy there, then that's a moment not for me to like harp on, no, 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 it's this and make sure mm -hmm. that that's really accurate. Because again, the goal is for for this particular segment, for them to learn the song and sing that accurately. Mm -hmm. Instead, I would just be like, oh, well, let's do this instead. La, 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 or just or something like that, right? Just yes. change it so that the job is accessible and feels easy so mm -hmm. that we can go ahead and, and move forward with learning this on. Cool. Yeah. There's one more thing I want to ask you. Um, <clears throat> something that we mentioned in the beginning, sorry, I'm clearing my throat. Um, something that we mentioned in the beginning is um, teaching the song right the first time. And so where do you stand on memorization when teaching a new song? Do you have like a... when I when I teach a song? Yeah. Oh, and um, I don't know how I would hold notation in my hand and do body percussion at the same time and float <laughs> around the room. Right. Because like someone needs like a little um, attention from the teacher. So I'm just going to go like sit behind them and keep teaching and then someone else needs it. So I'm going to go sit behind them. And I don't know how I don't know how I would do it if it were not memorized. Now, mm -hmm. that said, um, I don't think it's detrimental. Like if you have the music mm -hmm. on the stand and you just like, you know, glance at it and see how it goes. Um, I think I think kids can tell if you don't know the song. Mm. And if you have it as a reference, I think that's one thing. But if you like 100% don't know it at all, that's, that's, I feel like that's different. Maybe like pick a different song and then come mm. back to that one, you know, in, in the next week. Like nothing, nothing bad happens if you wait a week, right? So like I think it's worth knowing the song backwards and forwards and knowing it, you know, inside out, upside down, inside, outside, upside, downside, you know the song everywhere, you know. Um, I think it's worth it to really have it in your brain and in your heart mm -hmm. and in your body before you bring it to kids. But I want to, again, like I, I do, I don't want to sound um, – <clears throat> judgmental right because like we've right. all had a new song that we've learned and we're like wait a minute hang on right and you go and you go reference it but that's that's very different from being like well let me play it on piano and learn it you know in the lesson right so you tell right. me what, yeah. do you, what do you think I don't I don't want to stick my foot in my mouth and like you know be rude no I agree <laughs> I agree no I think that as you said there's always those instances where it's like it's a new song or it's one that like you know, and we're talking about this is different than like all of the third grades in the entire district are learning this on and it's new to you and it's not part of you. You know, I mean, this, this, this is a side. So if yeah. it's something that you've intentionally thought about putting in your curriculum, that means that you're probably going to be using it for weeks, you know, lesson after lesson after lesson, right? You're going to be doing different things with it, expanding it. So yes, exactly what you said. If you need a memory jog, that's one thing. But I think the importance of memorizing is not just so that you can memorize, but there's kind of two parts to this. The first is if your goal is to teach the song 
accurately the first time so that you can extract curricular elements, it's really important that you know all of those curricular elements, right? So you and I are big on like analysis and like looking at on and like thinking about what it's good for, which is probably mm-hmm. a podcast episode we could do. But thinking about like, okay, yeah, write it down. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> um, uh, thinking about like all of the different melodic elements, all the different rhythmic elements, which one, what the form is, what's the same, what's different, all of that type of stuff. If you're doing that type of work, If you're doing that type of work, number one, you're going to have this on in your brain. If you're doing the type of work where you are thinking about how you're going to break down teaching a song and like, what's the next question? What am I going to ask them to say next? If you're thinking about things this deliberately, you're going to memorize it. You know, if we're talking about a 16 beat song, if you're talking about like a four, a four phrase song, like it's going to be in your brain if you're spending five, 10 minutes looking at how you're going to teach it to kids. Mm but all of that to say that's so important because if you're going to teach a song accurately well what does that mean you know you want to make sure that you're able to teach a song and you're able to have the kids perform it independently from you which is something we haven't said yet so you're singing for your kids not necessarily with your kids right um and so this idea is that if they are singing independently then you're able to give feedback or remediate a phrase as necessary like oh wait hold on just a minute that actually went i'm gonna marry who i please sing that for me i'm gonna marry you know and so on and so forth so that then we can put that back in and make sure that we have everything accurate because we've also all had the experience where we taught a song quickly and then we went back to it the next <laughs> week it's like who, t- who taught you how to sing the song like did victoria come in with her tridio variant and like screw up my entire lesson you know right, like that's that right <laughs> so so i think that all of those things are really important to consider. You know, and we're just talking about, oh, it's just a song. But again, when we're talking about teaching in this intentional way and all of the different ways you can break down a song into different activities and ways that you can layer it, it's really important that this first experience has that sort of attention to detail. So. Because this is the foundation. This is, we're going to pull everything else that we do is going to come from this song. So if right. the melody isn't there, we're going to have a hard time. If the melody is not in our ears, we're going to have a really hard time extracting a melodic target. If the rhythm is not in our bodies and our brains and our hearts, we're going to have a really, really hard time pulling that and creating our own ostinato from it. Or like when we transfer and we add the game, which is another layer mm-hmm. that we didn't talk mm-hmm. about, right? Like if, if this foundation isn't there, um, and again, we're not asking anything that students are not capable of. They're capable of all of this that we're asking of them. And it's reasonable for us to expect a high level of musicianship in terms of just accuracy of a 16 beat song, right? So what can we do to help these students? And the answer is we have, um, we know the song backwards, forwards, inside, outside, upside, downside. We have, um, a, a set of scaffolds that we're going to walk through. We have things that the teacher's going to do and that the students are going to do and ne'er the two shall meet. Like we're not going to get those <laughs> things <laughs> mixed up. Um, and then we're going to remember to add, and this is what we talked about, like we're going to, we're adding our facial expressions. We're, mm-hmm. we're like acting like when students discover something or uncover something in the song, it's like the most cool thing that they could do, right? Like we, we add some energy to it. So it's not, it's not dry. Do you know what I mean? Um, and when you put all of these together with some strategies for what to do when students don't accurately sing the song or whatever it is, um, we just have a much more musically accurate product that we can use as a springboard for other things later yeah no i love it i think that's a great a great place to tie it up (laughs) 